are my God. Early in the morning, I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land, where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Fathers, we gather this morning in your house. Lord, we are seeking your face collectively as your people gathered in your name on your day in your house to worship you. And so, Father, I pray that as we worship you, God, that, that our eyes are fixed and focused upon you and that we may drown out the cares of this world and, and even the struggles and trials that so many of us may be facing, Lord, that we may just lay them down at your feet and that we may just get a glimpse of your glory and your power and, Lord, that you would just move in a powerful way. And so, Lord, as we worship you, all eyes are on you. We ask, God, that you would do your, your thing in our midst. For we pray and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If you want to take out your Bibles and, and go ahead and turn them to the book of Ruth. Uh, we'll be in Ruth chapter 2 uh, this morning. If you were with us last week, uh, we talked on the subject of not leaving the place of blessing, not leaving that place of blessing. And we're going to um, continue in the book of Ruth. We're going to learn today or talk today about uh, learning to dream again. But I want to just do a little bit of a recap from last week for those that may not have been here to kind of give us a running start of, of where we're going this morning as we're dealing, as I said, with the subject matter of learning to dream again. But in order to dream again, we've got to get back to that place of blessing. And so in understanding a little bit of the book of Ruth, um, this book was written in a time in which Israel had no king. Matter of fact, if you were to turn uh, your Bible over one, one page and get to the book of Judges, you would see the commentary of the day and age in which Ruth lived, or that of Naomi, her mother-in-law. And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Uh, their king was God. Uh, and then because they had rejected God, uh, they had become a God unto themselves. And it says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Kind of sounds a lot like our culture in which we're living. And when you read into the first chapter of the book of Ruth, one of the things that you discover is that there is a crisis because there is a famine that has hit Jerusalem, Another, um, that has hit Bethlehem, that has, has hit the people of God. And when you read in the Old Testament, you've heard me say this many times before, uh, anytime you see that there's a famine in the land, uh, you, you know that that has come directly from God uh, because he had warned Israel. He said, listen, you're going into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Uh, literally, it's going to be a land of blessing. And if you walk with me and live in this covenantal relationship with me, I'm going to bless you. And one of the ways I'm going to bless you is I'm going to send the early and latter rains and you're going to have a tremendous crop and I'm going to have, be your hedge of protection. I'm going to bless you. But the day that you reject me, chase idols, do what you want to do in your own eyes, what we saw in Judges, the last verse in Judges, um, he says, then I'm, I'm going to begin to bring my disciplined hand upon you. Blesses and curses he put before his people. And so in Ruth's day, uh, which ultimately Naomi's day, and, which is Ruth's mother-in-law, and Imelech, which was her father-in-law, there was a famine that came on the land. And instead of staying in Bethlehem, the house of bread, in the land of Judah, uh, the place of praise, and, and leading the charge to repentance and seeking God's face for whatever reason. Well, we know the reason because there was no food. They went to Moab, and they went to a foreign land. And in that, they left that place of blessing. And in that, there was much heartache and hardship because not only did Imelech lose his life, but also his two sons, um, and Ruth ends up becoming Naomi's daughter-in-law, obviously before one of her sons, before her son passed away. And we saw all of that last week, and we saw how Ruth went from being known as a, a woman that was pleasant to where she was just bitter because of her circumstances. Matter of fact, even uh, Elimelech, Elimelech, that was her husband before he died, his name literally meant God is king, but yet he didn't really live as if God was king because he went to Moab instead of really just seeking God's face and leaving that place of blessing. And so 
this whole book is, is really about God's grace and, and how God meets us where we are and, and getting where we need to be and, and ultimately the kinsman and redeemer, which we're going to talk some about today. But we ended chapter 1 with Naomi back in Jerusalem with a daughter-in-law named Ruth, or excuse me, Bethlehem. And back in that place where, where, where she is back to the place and the point of where um, she is in a place where God's going to bless her. And so in that, I just want to remind you of just five things that we drew from last week's message. And then we're going to walk through chapter two, and then I'm going to give you five more things uh, to challenge you uh, to really think about your own walk, about learning to dream again, especially if you're in that place, or you've been through that place where you just are just shattered and just broken and just weary and, and just really don't know what's before you and you've just quit dreaming. So here's what we've learned about getting back to the place of, of, of being in that place of blessing. One is our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus, not people and not circumstances. Because if it's on people and circumstances, it's going to overwhelm you. James says a, a double-minded man is, is, is unstable in all his ways. We can't get caught up in, in all of the, the hoopla and, and, and stay focused on Christ because you're going to be all over the place. What is an absolute must is our one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And it can go good for a week, and then we can drift, and we got to wake up, we got to get back to where we're supposed to be. And that is our one-on-one -on -one time. That is our, our sacred moment. That is a time in which it absolutely has to be a must. It's going to be an anchor in our lives, is meeting with Him on a regular basis and having our eyes fixed upon Him. Um, two, it, we, we learned that you can't outrun your problems. Naomi, Emily, they tried to do that. And, and many times when we do that, things go from bad to worse. Things will go from, from bad to worse. And so you've, you've got to weather the storms. You can't have this flight mentality. And there's a lot of us that kind of have that flight mentality. When things get really bad, we're just going to run. And so many of us, we, we've even done that within the church in, in our life. When things get bad, well, I'm just going to quit going to church. And I'm just going to, going to kind of drift into the world a little bit. And that's really what Moab was a picture of. It doesn't work. The fire will only intensify. You can't outrun God. I can't outrun God. He's everywhere. And so what we have to do is to draw close to him and worship him and, and have our eyes fixed upon him, even when we don't understand what's taking place. And then we, we learn that, that God, sometimes in the midst of the greatest pain and the deepest trials and struggles, God gives some of the greatest gifts. And for Naomi, in this case, it was the daughter-in-law Ruth. Matter of fact, when you, we get to the end of this book, one of the things that, that is said about Ruth is that she's greater than having seven sons because of her love and her commitment. And it probably took Naomi a while to realize this blessing that God sent her her way. But here's the thing. Anybody that's walked through tragedy and hardship and, and heartache, and we all have, and we're all going through it at different levels, um, when you look back and you see God's faithfulness and his, and, and his goodness, you will see how God has come along and he has sent the right people at the right time or the right blessings at the right time and, and just encouraged us. And, and those are some of the biggest and best blessings that God gives us. And sometimes they go even unnoticed for a while until we have time to sit back and kind of reflect and say, man, if God wouldn't have showed up with this person at this time, I don't know how I would have ever made it. That is Ruth for Naomi. And then finally, the, thing, the last thing we, we, we gleaned from chapter 1 was that God's our only hope. There is no other deliverer. We see what we're dealing with from, from a, a national standpoint, really global standpoint, even with this, this virus. Uh, there, there is no, no hope in no political figure or political party. It is God and God alone. And what's gotten us in this mess is really simple. The hedge of protection has been removed from us because of our sin and our rebellion to God. We've pushed God out of every facet of society. So instead of the church leading a political march to try to make a difference, we need to lead a march to call people into repentance and to look to God and to fix our eyes on God because he's our only hope, period. So Naomi had to get back to Bethlehem, that place of blessing. She came back. She wasn't the woman that she, she left. She, she left as a person that was, was known as being pleasant. She came back. She's bitter. But she's, she went away full. She kind of came back empty. But, but she's not completely empty because God gave her Ruth as a daughter-in-law to be with her. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 2. And I told you this book's kind of like a chick flick, flick because it, it's got the, 
you know, the, the wealthy man that's going to sweep in and, and just take away all the problems. Um, so some of you ladies, you, I know you, you like this book, and it's, it's, a, it's a great book. But today, I really want to spend some time focusing on the theme of learning to dream again. Because here's what I, I notice with not only our church, but, but society, is that we've gone through this storm that we've been walking through now for, for a year and a half. And it's really probably been even longer than that. And the enemy is stealing not only our joy, but our hope for any type of better tomorrow, what God can accomplish in our lives. And when you get to the point to where you quit dreaming about what God can do in and through you and with your family and what the future can be, and then you start just, just looking and living in the past, Tim and Calvin and I were talking about this this week. I think Howard Hendricks is the one that says, when your past becomes greater than your future, you're already dead. And there's so much truth to that. And if we believe that God is a living God, not just the God of the Old Testament in the past, but he's the living God, meaning he's alive and he's active, that means that he's got a hope and he's got a future and, and we should be able to dream for that. And we know ultimately what we're longing for. And we also, man, we're, we're, we're definitely in the last of the last days and we see what's taking place in, in, in the book of Revelation and, and the tribulation and all of that stuff before us. And, 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 and maybe that, that's true. Obviously, the book of Revelation is true. But I will remind you that the book of Revelation ultimately is about getting to the very end of it to where the king of kings comes and literally sets up his kingdom here on earth. It's a victorious book, not a book that should cause us to tremble at our knees. Because there is much to live for, there is much to dream about, there is much for us to have excitement and to be anticipating for God to show up. One, we got to be in that place of blessing, meaning we got to be walking, we got to draw close to Him. And I'm thankful that He moves in my heart even when I drift, that He, he graces me enough to pull me back, and He does the same thing with you. That's why you're here today. But he'll take all of our brokenness and all of our bitterness and, and, and he will, 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 will take all of that and he will bring healing to us and he will allow the sun to shine on us again and he will give us hope to where we can dream again and hope for that preferred future of what he's going to do and we will live again and God will do some pretty neat things in our lives. And I think looking at Naomi and Ruth is a perfect example of learning to dream again because here they are they're in Bethlehem she's lost me and Naomi everything she's picked up Ruth and it's like where does she go from here she's lost her husband she's lost her two sons she's lost her protection her provider I mean she, she's just lost everything God's brought Ruth and she can't get rid of her because Ruth is that loyal to her she even tried to get her to go back but she wouldn't and there they are and it's like okay God what are you gonna do now with all this brokenness you know, how, how is there any hope or any future for me with all of this tragedy and just, just disaster? Well, what are you going to do with that? Some of you kind of feel like that today. Okay, God, <laughs> you look, look at where I'm at. Look, you know, I cried not to be here. I tried. I, I prayed. This is where I'm at. So, so what are you going to do now with all of this brokenness? You ever, you, you, can you identify? I will remind you that God, <laughs> his ways are not our ways. We say that all the time, and the scriptures tell us that. God majors in the resurrection. God always brings a, a deliverance to his people, especially when they humble down. God always shows up. He always hears the prayers of his people. Obviously, it doesn't happen the way we think it's going to happen, the timing we think it's going to happen, but it always happens. And not only that, he's, he's, he's promised us everything for all eternity to be with him. So now we're here, he, and he's big enough to say, hey, hey I can handle it. So, so God, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with all of this brokenness? And so let's pick up in chapter 2 and let's see what God does with Naomi. And it says, and so what I want to do, I want to read through chapter 2. And then at the end, I'm going to come back and I'm going to give some observations, some things that, that I pull from this, this chapter and learning to dream again and why it's so important. Um, verse 1 says, and there was a relative of Naomi. Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth. You see it says great wealth? 
I said, chick flick, that, that would be something you would like highlight, you would circle, right? Uh, there, there's this bachelor and he's, he's really rich and he's, he, he's, he's part of the, the family of Imelec, which his name was Boaz. And this is really important. And, and two things that we're going to see in verses 1 and 2 that you really got to understand to really get the book of Ruth. And the first one is that of a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer was, is, was something that was written into the Old Testament law for the people of Israel, and it was really a way for God protecting and caring for um, a widow, for one that was left really destitute, uh, and, and especially for, for a person that did not have any offspring, and even carrying on the legacy of the person that had died. Um, typically, with a, um, a kinsman redeemer, if a brother married did not have, or a man married did not have any children, um, and he died, then God would um, require, or the law would require, or challenge the younger brother to take up and marry his brother's widow and raise up an offspring to carry on the lineage and legacy of his brother. Now, I'll tell you, if, if that was true in America, we would really care about who our siblings married, wouldn't we? Um, but in that, they would, would be the kinsmen redeemed. They would redeem, they would step in. And in that, they would provide um, protection and, and they would just kind of resurrect the situation and, and the land and, and all of that. So all of that was tied into that and if there wasn't a brother to do that it would be the next of kin. And so it's not by accident it says that there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, because all of a sudden somebody comes on the scene who is qualified to be that kinsman redeemer, to resurrect all of that brokenness to bring life into a situation that just seems absolutely hopeless, and to be that kinsman redeemer. And by the way, for us, our kinsman redeemer is Jesus Christ, right? Aren't we just broken, lost, no, hopeless, nothing? And doesn't he step in as our brother and redeem us and buy us back and, and to make us right with God again, to give us a hope and an inheritance? All of this is a, a love story. It's a literal story, but it's a picture of what Jesus has done for us. And so, the kinsman redeemer. And so, that is important to know as we read through this and see how God is going to bring life to a dead situation. And so, verse 2 tells us that, um, so Ruth the Moabite uh, said to Naomi, he says, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And Naomi said to her, he says, go my daughter. And so the second <laughs> thing that we want to understand about the Old Testament law is not only that of the kinsman redeemer, but also that of how God commanded the, um, the Israelites, anybody that had a harvest, that they were not to, to pick all of the grain from their harvest. They were to leave some back for the purpose of taking care of the poor and the destitute. It was a, a welfare system, so to speak. But it was one that was done right because it required the people that needed it, that were poor, to work. And so there was integrity built in it to where you were, were working for it, but yet in the same sense you were being looked after. And so Ruth says to, to Nemesis, let me go to this field, let me glean uh, behind them and, and, and let me get enough for us to take care of us. shows a lot of the godly character and integrity of Ruth. And so those are two critical things because God is, is, is established that. That's part of his law that's built into this story. And so you have Boaz, who is the potential kinsman redeemer. Ruth, who's going out, who's gleaning in his fields. He's a very wealthy man. And then you've got Naomi, who is, is she's just bitter because she's broken. And she's got this godly daughter-in-law who's stepping up and saying, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to work. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get us through this. Okay, that's the, the narrative. And so let's read through um, verses 3 and following. It says, then she left and she went and she gleaned in the fields after the reapers. And it says that she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. I love the fact that she happened to come. <laughs> she, just, she just happened to end up there, um, which was part of the family of Imelech. And so now Boaz came to, uh, from Bethlehem. Now what's interesting, I told you that that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Notice that where did he come from? He came from Bethlehem. And where did our kinsman redeemer come from? He came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, Lord be with you. And what a powerful statement. Lord be with you. 
Isn't that what we want right now? This is what Boaz is saying to his reapers, but isn't that what we all want? God be with me? One of the things that I, I was saying in my prayer this morning, God stirred at me and it was, it was like three o'clock this morning. I'm just like wide awake and, and I'm just like, Lord, I just need to hear from you. I know you're with me. You won't leave me nor forsake me. I just want, I just want you to speak to me. I need to hear from you. Isn't it true that we can face just about anything as long as we know that God's with us and that we can hear from him and there's, there's just this clear, clear direction that he's leading us? And I get that sometimes in life that, that it's, he's quiet and, and we don't know exactly what to, to, to do or what steps to take. But man, what a, what a true thing that, that God is with us. Matter of fact, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And I don't think any of this is by accident. If we're going to learn to dream again, we got to know without a shadow of a doubt that God's got us and he's with us. One of the things we've learned over the last several weeks is that if we're going to desire for God to fill us with his spirit, to, to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of that being true is that the Holy Spirit manifests in our lives the truth that we belong to God, that we're his. That we're his children, that he's, he's our, our dad, he's our father, he's our God. And man, to, to know that, that God's with us and he's got us. And that he's got a hope and he's got a future and he's got a plan. If we're here and there's breath in our lungs, that we're here because God has a purpose and plan. And when that plan's up, we've already stated this a gazillion times, then it doesn't matter what, it's going to be, we're going home to glory. And even in that, he's got a hope and a future for us, right? Never, never to, to be departed from it again and, and, and to live more than we've ever lived before. But he's got us. And so here's Boaz walking on the scene, and, and you just see the godliness over this guy. The Lord be with you. And man, isn't that, and shouldn't that be our prayer not only for ourselves, but, but for our family members and, and for our church family members, our friends? Man, God, be with them. Manifest your presence. That's been the prayer that I have prayed for, for individuals that, that I knew that were close to going home to glory. And they had that, that before them. I'm like, Lord, I'm just asking more than anything that you manifest your presence to them. Manifest your presence in such a way that they get a glimpse of glory of what you have in store for them. Because once you have that, then well, guess what you can do again? You can dream. You can anticipate. You can get excited. You can begin to live again because you know there's a hope and there's a future. Why? Because you've seen the glory of God. The reason we're not dreaming right now is because we are missing, from, many of us, from seeing the glory of God. Seeing his hands, knowing that he's with us, knowing that he's got us. Man, you read through the book of Acts, these guys, these cats, I mean, excuse my terminology, but they're, they literally, they can stare death down. And I said before, make death blink because they have seen the resurrected Lord. And I'm telling you, they, they are, are more alive and, and more courageous than anything I've ever seen when you study the book of Acts. Why? It's because they, they knew the Lord. They had his presence. They got a glimpse of his glory. Man, if you could just get a glimpse of his glory, you can begin to live again. But if all you see is darkness, and by the way, if all we do is, is, is have our ears and our eyes tucked into the news of the world, no matter what side of the tracks you may be on, no matter where you may be gleaned from, I promise you, it will have a negative effect on you. But man, if we could just stick our nose in the book, and say, Lord, I want you to be with me. I want to hear from you. I need a word from you, God. Oh, what a difference it'll make. So here's Boaz. He says, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Verse 5, it says, and Boaz said to his servants who were in charge of reapers, who, who's this young woman? I find that, that interesting. Here's this wealthy man, and he's, a, you know, the perfect bachelor. He's, he's there, and he godly. He's got it all. He's, he's good. He's, he's godly. I mean, He's got a lot of money, or at least he's wealthy, and he, he notices this mobile. He's like, who's this woman? And when you're, you're broke and desperate, don't, don't you want to be noticed? I mean, ultimately by God, but, but in this situation, um, 
because she just happened to be in the field of Boaz. Verse 6 says that the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, this is a young Moabite woman that came back uh, with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And then she um, came and has continued from morning until now. Thus she rested for a little while in the house. You know what you see in Ruth? You see a tremendous work ethic. You don't see a person that just kind of sits back and just says, you know what? This is bad. This is like really bad. So I'm just going to crawl in the corner and wait for it's our time to go. She says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my part. I'm going to do my part. If you're wanting a hole dug and you're leaning on the handle of a shovel and praying for that hole to take place, you're going to be waiting there a long time. God expects us to do our part. God expects us to put one foot before the other. It's part of walking by faith. It says, then Boaz said to Ruth, he says, um, will you listen, my daughter, will you not, or will you not, do not go and glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay here close to my young women. So, so now you can see the, the romantic story, you know, beginning to kick in gear. He's, he's wealthy, he's rich, he's that perfect bachelor, he's taking notice of her, and he's saying, hey, I want you to stay here. Stay close here, glean in this field, don't, don't go anywhere else. And what he's doing is, we'll read, continue to read here in a few moments and we'll see, he's already providing protection and security for her. Already showing up and, and providing some of these things. And Boaz said to Ruth, um, he told her to stay close. And then verse 9 uh, tells us that, um, let your eyes be on this field which, you, uh, which they reap and then go after them. It says, I have not commanded the young men that they not, are not to touch you, and when you are thirsty, that go to the vessels, drink, and, and so forth. So he's saying, listen, nobody's going to touch you. And you think being a widow, being a woman, you were very vulnerable. But being a Moabite woman, I think made you even more vulnerable. And all of a sudden, Boaz is beginning to put a hedge of protection around her. Let me ask you a question. Is this God doing this? Or is it more... Boaz doing it. So it's kind of both. Well, that's their answer. It is both, but it's, it's God ultimately doing it through the hands of Boaz. And it's God blessing, even in the midst of brokenness. And so verse 10 tells us that uh, she fell on her face. She bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? What, what an act of gratitude. Just humility, brokenness. You know, one of the things that, that we've, we've lost is that of humility, that of just gratitude. We have this, this spirit of entitlement that what I'm entitled, I, it belongs to me, this is what I deserve. Friends, you know what we deserve? Death and hell. If the church will just get back to the place of humility, and realize that if it isn't for God's mercy and His grace, then, then we, we know what our faith is and what we deserve. Boaz answered and, and said to her, um, It has been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and you have come to a people whom you did not know before. And says, the Lord repay you, or pay your works, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel. It says, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Who are you going to for refuge and strength? And I promise you, if you are walking by faith, and you're doing the right thing and you're humbling yourself down and you're going above and beyond even what's asked of you you're like God I'm doing the right thing and things aren't changing for me and and nobody even notices I want you to know this God notices and not only does he notice but he will bring it to light at the right time when it needs to be brought to light one of the 
observations that I'm going to share with you that I gleaned from this is that when we sow good seed, we reap good fruit. And we can talk about how much we love God. But until we really begin to believe the scriptures that he's good and he does have a hope and he does have a future and he sees every tear, every sorrow, every heartache, and he says, I got you. Until we believe that he's a good God and begin to sow good seeds of faith, then we shouldn't expect much change. Then she said to him, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, that you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. She's a foreigner. She should, could have very easily, and in many cases, would have been ostracized, stiff-armed. And here she is, someone who is not like anyone else, but is demonstrating godly character. And she's putting one foot before the other, and she's like, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know what God's going to do with this. But you know what? I'm going to trust him. Now, you know what I find interesting is that Ruth, relatively, is very young in the faith. Naomi's a lot older. She grew up in the ways of God. And one of the things that I've noticed about us as believers, sometimes the longer we live in the faith, the more we kind of get set in our ways. The more we just kind of get to the point, well, this is just the way it's going to be, and we just kind of get this grown on, we just kind of get complacent. Go find you somebody that had just come to faith in Jesus Christ. And you'll typically find someone that will get you so uncomfortable because they will believe that God can do the impossible. And it'll stir in your heart to say, you know, I don't think I'm walking in faith at the level that I once walked to learn to trust in God. It's not by accident. If you study church history, every major movement of God typically has come from young people. Why is that? Because they're just crazy enough to believe that God can do the impossible. But it's like once we get churched, then we get our little religious tire and we just kind of sit back and we just, we're just waiting for, for Jesus to come back or we're just waiting to go see him through death. This is just the way it is. Do you remember when you were young in the faith and you would spin much time in prayer believing God for the impossible and you'd have some old saint come along and say, well, well don't get your up too much. But yet you defied that and, and you prayed and, and you were persistent and you seen God show up. Maybe the reason we're not seeing God is we just don't have faith to believe that he will show up and do something. Maybe we've just come to the point where we spiritualize everything. We just think, well, the best that we have in this life is just to kind of live and, and, you know, put up with one another and, and, and just die and go to glory. I think God wants us to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, to be bold as lions, to believe the impossible. Even when our dreams are shattered, never forget when God placed upon my heart the calling of ministry. Man, I had it all figured out. God was going to do this, 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 and that. It was going to work just like that, and everything was going to fall in place. And you know what happened? The rug got pulled out from under me. Everything that I thought was, was, was and the reason it was happening was and, and going to fall the way it did, it went the exact opposite. And it just left me in a bewildered state, and it made me begin to question everything about God. Well, if I was wrong with God about here, how do I know I'm right, that I was right here, here, and here? And I went through this wilderness, uh, wilderness season of life to where I just did not know <laughs> heads from tails. But God, in his infinite wisdom and goodness and mercy, met me where I was and slowly began to build me up. And at the right time, in the right place, he resurrected those old dreams and put me on solid ground. And when I got to that place and I look back, I'm just like, 
I don't know how you did that, God. Never saw that coming, never anticipated that. But that's how God works. And that's what's happening here. You say, well, I would have never chosen this path. I guarantee you Naomi wouldn't have either. Guarantee you Job wouldn't have. And most other saints that are recorded in Scripture. But God has a plan. And a purpose. And the cool thing from Naomi is that she's going to see it worked out on earth. And then she's going to have all eternity to be with what was lost on earth. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, he says, come here, eat the bread with me. Dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. And so she sat beside, beside the reapers and they passed the parched grain to her. And she ate and was satisfied. And he, she kept some back. By the way, that, that meal that's being shared there kind of sounds a, sounds a little familiar, doesn't it, to the meal that was shared with, with Jesus' disciples, even communion, which we've got to do here very soon as a church, of that covenantal relationship that we've entered into. kind of sounds a lot like that. Like I said, there's a, there's, this is a, there's a typology, that of, of Christ, Boaz is. And she kept some back for who? For Naomi. Why? Because she cares for her mother-in-law. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded the men, saying, Say, let her even basically glean among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Don't, don't let her just get the leftovers. Let her get in here and get some of, of the best. You can see that Ruth is already capturing Boaz's heart. You know how she does it? Through humility, through a work ethic, through godly character. And Boaz is no doubt capturing her heart because of his goodness and because of his godliness. Maybe the wealth had something to do with it, I don't know. But it says also, it says, let the grains from the bundle fall purposely for her and leave it that she may glean also and do not rebuke her. So, so this is what's taking place. All of a sudden, in a dead situation, life is beginning to take place. Here's a person, here's, Ru I mean, here's Boaz, here's Ruth. Um, there, there's protection, there's food starting to come in. God is beginning to move and show up in some ways probably Naomi never anticipated. Ruth goes back to, to her mother-in-law. She's telling her all these things. Matter of fact, look at verse 20. Um, she's telling her all that's taking place, and then Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said, This man is a relation of ours, one of our, our closest relatives, one who could be a kinsman and redeemer. Two things here. Naomi is all of a sudden beginning to have life because of Ruth. And then all of a sudden her wheels are turning. Wait a second. There may be something that, can, that, that God may be doing here that's not just for the, the moment, for the harvest season, but long term. And all of that was spilled over out of Ruth. I'm going to tell you something. Do you want to make a difference? You say, I, I don't know what to do. You want to make a difference? Start living for Jesus because it becomes contagious. When people see you excited, they see God's hand working on you. It just kind of just spills over. It kind of breaks the, the negativity, the doom and gloom, the hopelessness. Because you have your hope in the one who can give hope. So with that, let me share with you five things that, that I just, just kind of jotted down as I just read and meditated on that chapter. And I said, God, what, what are those things for me about dreaming again that are a must things that, that, that I would, would glean from here so here's number one and some of these may overlap but, but this is just kind of where the Lord has, has just kind of placed upon my heart number one you don't ever know the blessing God may have waiting for you around the corner you just don't ever know you don't know the Boaz that's around the corner you don't know the blessing that God has all we, we see is the here and now, but God holds our future. 
And so if he says, I've got you, you're my son, my daughter, and, and <laughs> Jesus even says in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. I mean, we know in one sense what's around the corner, but he says, I mean, we, we have no idea of the blessing that God has for us. So serving. Serving. Two, like Ruth, live with integrity and godly character. Because if we don't walk with God and live this out, then we're not going to put ourselves in line to even recognize the blessing when it comes. There's never an excuse to live in rebellion to God. You see, what does God require of me? He wants obedience. Period. Three, this kind of overlaps with it, but it just kind of goes in a different direction. Step out in faith, work hard, and let God's favor guide you. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know this. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to meet with Jesus. I'm going to walk out. I'm going to practice the presence of God. I'm going to dream for that preferred future. I'm going to ask God to show up in my midst, and I'm going to believe that he has his hand on my life, and I'm going to let him, this be a walk, what it's supposed to be, and I'm going to let God do his thing and let his favor be upon me. Kind of sounds like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Quit trying to figure it out. Lean not on your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Practice the presence of God. And what? He will make your way straight. I was put in a situation just this week. Literally this week, Friday, that I did not know what to do. And it really fell on me. It's like, if I go this way, I could get eaten alive. If I go that way, I could get eaten alive. It could cost someone their life. So what, what do I do? How, how do I even know that I'm making the right decision? And I just came to the point. I said, you know what, God? You're the one that gives wisdom. You're the one that gives direction. I'm going to put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 into practice. You're my God. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to walk with you. And whatever decision that I feel like you lead me down, I'm going to trust in you, and I'm not going to second-guess myself. Because if you do those things, you're walking by faith. We've said it before. Do I do this? Do I don't do that? I hear this. I hear that. What do you believe? Do I wear this? Do I don't wear All of this noise. Don't let it cripple you. Go before the throne, spend more time in the book than everywhere else. Put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in practice and let God lead. And don't worry about the results. Let the results deal with, let, let God deal with those. Ruth couldn't produce a Boaz, could she? God had to. We couldn't produce a Savior, could we? God had to. Last night with my little Levi, I'm reading through the Genesis account because he was quoting to me that day. In the beginning, God did this and God did that. He said, what happened on this day? What happened on that day? I said, you know what, tonight, I said, we're going to open up our Bible and we're going to read through the Genesis account. And so we opened up his children's Bible and we were reading through it. He's like, Dad, that's a lot to read. I said, it is, but we're going to read through it. And we read through it and, and, and we were talking through it. And as I was, was reading through that, and this is something I've always known, you've known it, but it was just the Spirit of God reminding me of it. You know what God created this world for? For us. Why did Christ come? For us. Why is death being defeated? For us. When you can begin to see that God is for us and not against us, you say, wait a second, this may be tough, but God's doing something and I can trust him. Fourth, sow good seeds and reap good fruit. God has made it so clear to me in my life here of late that whatever a person sows, they reap. If you don't believe me, just look at your own life. I won't tell you to try this, but I, I, I'll tell you. You start gossiping about someone, notice when you get word that someone's gossiped about you. 
And when you do, I hope the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance, hey, the preacher said, whatever you sow, you reap, because it's true. You treat someone with contempt and nasty to them, just give it a little bit of time, it'll come right back to you. And by the way, just as a side note, you don't have to confront everything. That has been the hardest lesson for me to learn. You don't. I'm telling you, God does a far better job of disciplining. And I've been on both sides. You know, it's like reading through Proverbs, we were talking about this the other night. I've been on both sides where I've been the idiot and been the wise person. And if you're honest, you have too. So, so good seed. And the only way that's going to happen is you're going to stay close to the Savior. And then finally, and we've seen this in the closing, your acts of faith will help others see God's goodness. They will. So how do we begin to dream again? We've got to begin to believe again that God's good. And don't say it as a cliche, believe it. He's good. And he's for you. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to just play some music softly for a few moments. And, and here's, here's my challenge to you. Because when you leave, you're going to be inundated with a hundred different things. But, but this is your moment. God, you've heard this message. Would you spend just a few moments asking God to work in your life. We're not praying for someone else right now. We're praying for you. God, help me to dream again. Help me to see your goodness. Help me to believe I have a hope and that there's a hope and a future for me. Would you be willing to pray 